Hey, good morning. Welcome to virtual edition of Sacred City Moline. I, I just want to thank you guys for adapting with us here. It really did break my heart to have to cancel our Sunday gatherings the last couple Sundays. It was really due uh, mostly to the fact that uh, our leaders and volunteers that would normally lead out from the front or downstairs in kids' ministry, a large number of these people uh, either had a close contact or had contracted COVID-19, and so it was really in the best interest of everybody that we just hiatus for a little bit, but we are hoping that this Sunday is the last Sunday of going purely virtual. I know that there are going to be some people that are going to opt out for the time being while COVID spike is up uh, in the Quad Cities, but... Um, we plan to be moving back in person next Sunday, and I hope that you'll join us uh, as we come back together in person uh, with masks, socially distanced, uh, to worship Jesus together because there's really no way to replace an in-person gathering. Um, and so looking forward to that next week. Um, if you're just joining us, we've been working our way through uh, the Sermon on the Mount, spending a couple, of, we've been here for a couple of months at this point, um, and, and the Sermon on the Mount really is not only Jesus' most famous discourse, like the, the most famous sermon or, or sayings that Jesus has put together through his ministry, but actually the most prolific and, and, and um, meaningful public discourse in the course of human history. Um, what sets this apart from anything else? So modern preaching these days, a lot of the times, is basically reduced down to tips and tricks to help you to live a better life. That's not the way that Jesus preaches. Jesus is doing something radically profound, something that's far more than just a little bit tricks and trip tips, that ways to tweak your life here and there. He's announcing the arrival of the kingdom of heaven. He's saying that the kingdom of God is here and now, right now, like, like the, the sun that cracks through uh, on, in, on the morning dawn, um, breaking through the darkness. The kingdom of heaven is here, and here right now, yet... It has not come in its fullness. Jesus is showing us that the, the kingdom of, of heaven, the kingdom of God, has this already but not yet properties. And, and when we have entered into the kingdom of heaven, he's showing us how to live the kingdom life here and now. How the dynamics of the kingdom of heaven get into the nitty gritty of our everyday life, specifically in the context of our relationships. And that's really what we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks here, how the dynamics of kingdom impact relationships. And what we're looking at here this week specifically are verses um, 31 through 32 in chapter five, where Jesus is breaching the topic of marriage and divorce. Now, divorce is a tricky, tricky topic. Anytime it you, you preach on it anytime you talk about it. There's so much nuance. There, there's also just the personal dimension of it, of people having different experiences and encounters with it in their own personal story. Um, and so what makes this even harder is doing this in a virtual format where I have no idea who's watching this. And so I, I realize the work that's been cut out for me this morning is very hard, very difficult, very challenging. And I realize that the topic of divorce in the church has been weaponized against people. It's been used to, to condemn people and make them feel less than. And I want to uh, uh, let you know that I, I'm, I'm leery of doing that. I have no intentions of, of weaponizing divorce, of condemning anybody. In fact, I would say that Jesus has no intentions of doing that either, although Jesus is speaking with grace and with truth. So there's truth to what he's saying, and there is grace in it. But that doesn't mean that we might not feel a pinch given our previous experiences here. And so I, I want to take a look at this, um, at this passage, this topic of divorce, not to condemn, but to commend you to a higher, more glorious vision of what marriage is, specifically how the gospel shapes marriage and how the gospel sustains marriage. Because because this is what it means to be kingdom oriented. It's, it's to have our, our minds and, and our hearts and our affections reoriented around the person and work of Jesus and let that sort of determine our course for life. And that makes us countercultural. To be a kingdom person sets you at odds with the normal everyday flow of our culture. And so Jesus here is calling Christians, kingdom people, to be countercultural in the way that we approach marriage and divorce. So if you would join with me as we read here, Matthew chapter five, verses 31 and 32. 
Jesus is saying to his people. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let, let's pray together as we jump into this. Uh, you pray for me, I'll pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word uh, and the fact that Jesus isn't just this the Savior who, who pulls us out of our muck and our mire and, and, and lets us figure it out for ourselves, but he's actually guiding us into the real good life, into meaningful life following him. And so I pray, Father, that, that as you speak to us through your word, that you would make us not only acknowledge what Jesus is teaching, but to be desirous of it, that we would long to follow his ways, to walk according to his paths, that you would make us into kingdom people. So Father, would you open our ears to hear from you? Would you, would you um, I think when it comes to topics like this, we, we so quickly want to plug our ears and block out what you have to say, but open up our ears to hear, soften our hearts to receive God, quicken our hands and our feet to follow you and act according to your ways. Would you help me to speak with precision, with accuracy to what the truth of your word holds, um, but also in a pastoral way, knowing that people, this is a, a, a very difficult uh, topic. So God, would you be with us? Would you show us this vision for the good life and help us to live according to this? Uh, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Nobody wants divorce. Right? Nobody does. Nobody, nobody sets out. There's, there's never been a, a young couple in love that's right in that the, the, the dating phase where they're about to be engaged where it's like, you know what I really want for my life? I just wanna, wanna meet somebody, fall head over heels, and then I just wanna end it. Nobody wants that. We want this story of marriage that's this happily ever after. That's really what we're all, all craving. We want these successful marriages that are meaningful and fulfilling, but the reality is that kind of a marriage isn't easy. There are so many obstacles and challenges that stand in the way of, of this beautiful, fulfilling marriage. There's so many conflicts that come when you share your life with someone in the most intimate and vulnerable kinds of ways. And when we exit the honeymoon phase, whether that's the first month, year, 10 years of marriage, or, or even like when the kids have gotten out of the house and you're left with your partner, your spouse, who you, you keep butting heads with and, and you're having these disagreements and it seems not to be going the way it was meant to be, at least not the way that you envisioned it when you got uh, engaged at the beginning. And you start to wonder, you, start, you hit this hard season and you start to ask, am I doing something wrong? Like, why is this so hard? Why, why would I commit to being part of something that's so difficult and taxing and draining on me? In fact, you might even just ask, is marriage supposed to be like this in the first place? Is it meant to be this hard? And when you read the Bible and you start out in Genesis chapter one and you start working your way through, well, what we see is that marriage is, is been part of God's creation since the beginning and it will move forward into the new heavens and new earth where marriage will exist. So marriage isn't going away. And then in, in looking at the beginning when God created marriage, we see that God created marriage to be a joyful and lifelong union between one man and one woman for the rest of their life. Something that was uh, satisfying, something that was fulfilling to them that gave them a deep experience of physical and emotional and relational intimacy with someone else. In fact, when Adam looks at Eve, God had walked previously walked all of the animals in creation before Adam. Adam's looking for a helper that's fit for him, a companion that's fit for him. And he's like, nope, nope, nope. And then alas, he meets Eve and bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He's just enraptured by this woman. And this, this is just the beginning that starts the trajectory for their marriage, where marriage was meant to get better and better and better with age, like fine wine. And, and the, the, the design of this marriage is to provide a context, a place for human flourishing, a place that offered stability and partnership and, and companionship, right? This, this sense where you're, you're grounded and anchored in this relationship with this person so that no matter what comes in life, you have a bit of stability. You have that, that foundation. Now, while we experience glimpses of that within marriage, like, I hope that your marriage is marked by that in some sense, of that, that fulfilling physical, or relational, emotional connection, this intimacy that we have, but, but in large, by large, that's not always the case. 
In fact, there's a lot of, of dysfunction, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain that gets induced when you're married. It's because we're married to a sinner. That I'm a sinner in marriage, and I've been married to a sinner. What happened here? What happened to get us from this, this glorious vision in, in the Garden of Eden to what we are left with right now? Well, in the Garden of Eden, we're told uh, by Genesis chapter three, Satan infiltrates his way into the Garden of Eden, this, this land of perfection and beauty, and he wages war on marriage. Sin is introduced, and, and you can see this, where he goes and attacks the, the union that Adam and Eve has by questioning Adam's leadership, makes Eve start doubting, and, and, and then they start blaming each other, and so you see marriage is under attack, and then the effects of sin trickle down from there, where you see the pains and the agonies, the curse of sin that comes to bear specifically on, in the context of marriage. And, and while Adam and Eve didn't divorce, right, they, they stayed together as far as we know. They stayed together. Um, they had more kids. They didn't divorce. However, the seeds of divorce were planted in their hearts. And every human heart that would come after them would have these seeds implanted, the seeds of mistrust and envy and discontentment, the seeds of selfishness and apathy and pride, self-centeredness. And when these seeds come to fruition, these seeds are the weeds that, that, that produce weeds which will then choke out marriage, right? They overtake. It's like a, a, f- a flower garden that's overrun by weeds until all you've got left are dandelions and these crabgrass that's just choking out the beautiful thing that's meant to be there. And it's no secret, using that, that illustration, you see, you know, the disruption that happens in this flower garden. You see the, the devastation, this brokenness, this dysfunction that, that is brought about through divorce where there's all kinds of hurt, right? In the wake of divorce, there will always be hurt. And for a lot of people, if they get divorced, it feels like their heart has been ripped in two. It's been, been, been torn apart because what we're told here in the Garden of Eden, when God present, presents Adam to Eve or Eve to Adam, he says, here, men and women are, are to be joined together It's actually God himself that's joining men and women together where the two become one flesh and it says what God has joined together let no man separate. See the bond of marriage is never meant to be broken. God had never put intentions for divorce to be part of uh, of the equation in marriage. And so you see, you feel that reality in divorce of this brokenness, this, this anguish of being torn apart. And it's not just an anguish and brokenness that, that is limited to the two parties involved, right? Just the husband and the wife that end up getting divorced. There's this ripple effect. It, it, it trickles down into other avenues, other arenas. If, you're, if you have kids, statistically speaking, if you, if you get divorced and you have kids, your kids are far more likely to get divorced when they get married someday. Right, that tri- trickle effect works its way down generation to generation. Not only that, if you are married and divorced, then the chances of your second, third, and fourth marriage, whatever those consecutive marriages are, succeeding goes down and down and down each time. Right? There's this trickle effect. The brokenness sort of compounds in divorce. Now, there, there's different cultural approaches to uh, divorce. There, it used to be that divorce was sort of a taboo, right? It was something that, that didn't happen. No matter what you did, uh, no matter what your marriage was like, no matter how dysfunctional it was, you would just put your head down, slog it out, you know, make it happen because divorce just isn't an option. You hear this early, early on in, in the early uh, 1900s, even before then. It just wasn't an option. It's just you stuck to it. But Later on, um, within the last 50, 60 years or so, uh, the no-fault divorce was introduced. And, and with the introduction of the no-fault divorce, um, now, the, uh, divorce has always been around. It's not a new thing that just came out of the 70s. But, but really, this no-fault divorce took this divorce from this thing, like the absolute last resort happening in marriage, it brought it down lower, more accessible, was the fact that, that it became popularized. Divorce became a... Uh, the stigma was re- weakened. It became sort of like a, a natural thing. And to the point where now 40 to 50%, depending on what, uh, what statistic agency you go to, says that 40 to 50% of all marriages will end in divorce. There's been this replacement of where, where divorce was forhi- uh, prohibited, completely forbidden, is now kind of becomes commonplace. Now, recently, I mean, within the last decade or so, we actually see that divorce rates 
are declining. Um, and you might think, well, hey, we must be figuring it out. We, our marriages must be getting stronger. We're doing a better job at choosing our spouses. Maybe we're waiting a little bit longer. You see that? The, the age of marriage uh, is going up. But in reality, the reason why the divorce rates are lower at this point in time is because fewer people are getting married. See, what our culture tells us is that, I mean, you can look at, I mean, you go to the Atlantic, go to other posts that, that have discussions about marriage, and the question is not, is divorce a bad thing? The question is, is marriage a good thing, right? Should people actually be getting married at all, right? After all, it seems kind of outdated. It seems very restricting, especially given where, where our sexual ethic has, has drifted into in recent years. And so the modern solution to marriage is, is just to avoid getting married. And so, so we have this replacement of cohabitation where people, instead of getting married, instead of making a covenant, instead of standing before their friends and family and making vows to one another to pledge themselves to each other for the rest of their lives, people are just playing house. People are like, hey, I like you right now. I don't, want, I don't like you enough to make a commitment to you in front of people, in front of God, to, to, be, uh, to have the reality of two becoming one flesh. But I want to play house with you. I want to, you know, I, I want to, I want to do this. We can live together. We can, we can do stuff until you don't want to, right? It seems like with cohabitation, there's, there's an easy uh, access eject button because you haven't made any sort of legal commitment to each other, right? There's no paperwork that has to be filed, no divorce lawyers that have to be called into the scene. It sort of gives you an easy way out. And so this has become uh, the norm for a lot of our society, a lot of our culture. And, and it's really common in, in the church and our church is included in this where cohabitation becomes a solution to, to marriage. And the, and the justification for this is, well, I, I don't need a piece of paper to express how I feel about somebody. And when we hear that statement, this really reveals the heart of our culture's truncated understanding, truncated view of marriage, right? This small view of marriage, just as we saw last week, how Jesus has this high view of, of sexuality. Our culture has a small view. The same thing has happened with marriage. Our culture has this truncated small view of marriage where it's merely a profession of feeling. And if you go to a modern uh, wedding today, like you, one that's not grounded in some sort of orthodox church, you can see this in the vows that people write to each other because they're not using these traditional vows that, that root people in commitment and, and, and say until death do us part. A lot of the modern vows are basically like just an expression of the lovey-dovey in this moment in time, my love for you is so strong, but it has no sort of orientation towards the future of what happens if my feelings fade? What happens if this buzz, this honeymoon feeling expires? Well, and what happens is when our feelings wane, when, when the feeling becomes uh, a, a non-factor, well, that, that's the point where we hit the eject button. That's where divorce becomes an option. We pull the rip card and, and, rip cord and, and it's on to the next romance, right? Because it's all about the feeling. On to the next thrill. On to the next relationship that can give me this sort of buzz of what I'm looking for. And, and this is clearly where our, our culture minimizes marriage, but our culture, our generation, isn't the only generation or the culture that's truncated God's design for marriage. In fact, marriage has been under attack since the Garden of Eden. All sorts of counterfeits are being offered. And if the 21st century version of marriage is, rides all on the shoulders of our feelings, right, this romantic lovey-dovey feelings that we have, the first century's truncation was to basically have, have zero feelings in the equation, right? Not have any sort of affections for the person that you're marrying. And so it comes, becomes sort of this contractual agreement. It serves a utilitarian purpose. And a lot of times it wasn't, uh, an agreement between two individuals, right? Not just the, the bride and the groom that say, hey, I like you, I wanna spend the rest of my life with you. It was usually in the first century, especially where we're looking at here is Jesus on the hillside, it was something that was an agreement made between two parties, two families. And, and the reason that, that they would offer their, their, their children to one another is because it was a deal that was made to, to sort of improve their social status, to, to give them more property, more land, and sort of expand their prestige in, in that given time. And, and we see it, it's very often, not all the time, but very often there was no love, there was no companionship in this first century marriage. And, and when the utility of the marriage had run its course. When the, when the purpose had been fulfilled, it was easy 
to cut the marriage off, right? To end the marriage right there. I'm no longer getting anything out of this. We can just, we can end it and move on. And the reason for this is because of a skewed interpretation of Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse one. There's a few verses in there. And this, this is the, what Jesus is referencing here in Matthew's gospel, Matthew uh, chapter five, verse 31. He says, it's also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Now, what he's alluding, he's not quoting this, he's alluding to what's being said here, uh, what Moses says in Deuteronomy ch- chapter 24, where Moses is permitting a man to divorce his wife if he has found indecency in her. And what's happened, um, different sects of the Pharisees have taken this verse and interpreted it into, in, in very different ways. Very, there's multiple different interpretations of this verse, and, and they basically were arguing over this. So they're, in one camp, you have this very loose translation of what the word indecency means. Now, in one camp, indecency would be um, specifically like sexual immorality. If, if your wife is having an affair, you have not just the biblical grounds for divorce, but actually what their view was that divorce is then commanded, right? If there's sexual immorality, divor- the marriage has to be ended. It's commanded. That's what Moses is doing. And another interpretation of this loosely interpretates, interprets the word um, anything that is, uh, what's the word? I, I'm losing my spot right here. Anything that is, um, indecent would would include like anything like literally anything if he doesn't like the way his wife looks her hair doesn't like her cooking doesn't like the way she talked right that would be grounds he just is is dissatisfied with her therefore it's indecent and and therefore he can divorce her and this was sort of the those were the two main camps uh in in this first century when it came to the view of divorce And, and we see this this sort of nonsense, this, this, these poor interpretations coming to Jesus later on in Matthew's gospel in chapter 19. Jesus is asked by the Pharisees, he's a, they ask, is, the, is there any reason, is divorce uh, lawful for any and every reason? And Jesus kind of looks at them and says, what kind of question is that? He, he says no without actually saying no. What he does is he goes back to God's original design, his original tent for marriage in the Garden of Eden, and he says that, that in marriage, the two become one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man separate. And so what he's telling the Pharisees here is, first of all, divorce shouldn't be something that we look at as an option. There's really, in God's design for marriage, marriage is meant to last. These, la- these vows are meant to bring us to the end of our lives together. And this is one of the reasons why in traditional vows for marriage, you hear the words, till death do us part. It's this long and lasting permanent marriage commitment and the only way out of it is death. And Jesus is basically taking them back to the same way. So it's not that there's any grounds for divorce, that anything would qualify for divorce. Jesus says, here's here's the reality, that, that divorce is not part of the equation. It wasn't meant to be part of the equation. And Jesus is pointing them to the covenantal nature of marriage. That, that, that when we talk about covenant, what is a covenant? A covenant is, is the strongest of all promises, right? You, you got your different levels of, uh, of promises. You got the pinky promise. You got your spit promise, the blood promise. Well, a covenant is the strongest of all promises. It's where you're saying to another person, I'm gonna ho- hold up my end of the deal until the end, until, until our agreement reaches its completion, whatever that might be, no matter what you do. That, that's what the covenant is. I'm gonna hold up my end until the end, no matter what. And so Jesus is showing here marriage is a covenant. It's not, it's not something that's based on feelings. It's not something that's just a, a matter of legal commitment where you can jump out of it if you find a better opportunity or, or you can leave it if your feelings start to wane. Jesus is showing it's a radical commitment. That's what marriage is. It's a radical covenant, a radical commitment that for life I am committed to this. I'm committed to you. And then they sort of retort when, when Jesus gives that response, right? It, when Jesus says this divorce isn't part of God's design, they say, well, then why did Moses command it? See, again, here's this, this mis- misinterpretation of the law here where, where they believe that God is actually commanding divorce as something that must happen on the grounds of, of sexual immorality. But Jesus said, listen, God doesn't command divorce. Divorce is not a command, it's not an option, not a viable option, but a concession. That's what he says in Matthew chapter 19, and the reason for this, it's a concession for hard-heartedness. 
It's where either one or both parties in marriage, their hearts have been so overrun with the weeds of sin that, that the, the beauty of marriage can no longer be obtained. Now this is why when we look at the covenantal nature of marriage, why prenuptial agreements are antithetical toward Christian marriage, right? Because here it's saying like, that's acknowledging divorce as a plan B. Like, hey, if this doesn't work out, here's how we're gonna proceed as normal. Well, Christian marriage says, hey, there is no plan B. This is it. This is what we're working with. And so it's, it's, divorce is a reluctant provision that God gives to hardened hearts in order to prevent more damage from happening. See, God allows divorce, but he does not condone it, he does not celebrate it, because what's happening is divorce is sin is winning. Sin is running over the flower bed. And so we see just as Jesus prohibits divorce in Matthew chapter nine, he does so in, in chapter 19 as well. He says, listen, the divorce is not an option. In fact, divorce is a product of sin, but also it produces more sin. That it, If you give your wife a certificate of divorce, you are forcing her into adultery, and if you get remarried, then, then you are also in entry, entering into adultery himself. He's saying this is sinful. Now, he does give a caveat here. He does provide the exception of sexual immorality of being biblical grounds for divorce. And as you work your way through the New Testament, here's a little bit of sidebar about this. You work your way through the New Testament, there are other things that would qualify biblically, biblical grounds for divorce, right? Abandonment, abuse, and, and really when we work through this and, and asking the question, like are there biblical grounds for divorce? It's a, it's a very nuanced discussion. We, it's, it requires a lot of wisdom and a lot of discernment and you need help, right? And so I, I just wanna, if you're wrestling with this, if you're thinking the next steps for you in your marriage is divorce, I wanna meet with you, I wanna help you wrestle through this and talk through the, the biblical implications of what is appropriate for a Christian in marriage and divorce. End of sidebar. See, there, there is a way out, but Jesus is saying, listen, I don't, his view of marriage is so high, so beautiful, so glorious, that we should want to move deeper and deeper into that vision instead of abandoning it altogether. And while, while Jesus provides a way out due to a hard heart, he doesn't command it. See, this is part of the fact, this is part of what makes Jesus' stance on divorce so uh, scandalous for his time. Because uh, uh, these Pharisees are expecting that if, you, if your spouse commits adultery, then you will eject them, that, that you'll separate from them. That becomes a command, but Jesus urges against doing this. He said, you can do it, but there's also a way to get through this. And this is why his audience is so stunned by this. In Matthew 19, his disciples ask, if, if, divorce, if, if divorce isn't an option, right? If you're, if you're taking that off of the table with the exception of, of sexual immorality, well, it must be better than to not get married at all. Like that, that's, that's kind of the shock here. It's like if, if divorce is an option, then it's better to not make a commitment. Not better, it's better to not get married at all. And the reason for this is Jesus, it's revealing his, his weighty, his high view of, of marriage. Now we gotta ask this question, why does Jesus have such a high view? Why is divorce such a big deal to Jesus? It's because marriage points to something that's bigger and glorious than, than the story of one man and one woman. Marriage ultimately isn't about the people who are being married. Marriage is a story that points to a greater and more grandiose story, a story of God and his people. See, God steps onto the scene in the midst of the brokenness of sin and the waywardness of humanity, and he says, listen, I, I want to enter a relationship with you. See, what sin was was saying to God, I don't, we don't want anything to do with you. We, we want to figure this out on our own, go our own way. But God is saying, listen, I, I, I want to bless you. I want to multiply you. I want to bring you into a life of flourishing, and I want to make you my people. And so God puts out this offer here. here here's a covenant. Here's, and here he shows us, here's what it looks like to live within this covenant. Like, if you, if you want to get in on this agreement, here's what it looks like that you would you would follow his ways, right? This is where we get the idea of laws. And I was reading a book by Jonathan Pennington talking about um, how when we think of the word laws, we think of it in so like a, a dark sort of way, like something that just prohibits, something that hinders. But really what this is is a covenantal guideline for us. This is how you enter into the way of flourishing. 
That when you trust and obey God, not only are you solidifying the fact that you, are, that you belong to him, that you are his people, but you are giving yourself to his blessing and his promises that he's offering. Now, if you know the story of the Old Testament, you know that Israel, this, you know, God makes this agreement with Israel, with Abraham and his, his children and his children's children. Israel failed at keeping this covenant. Israel failed at living within God's ways. There were times where they did this well, right? And they got to see glimpses of flourishing where things went well for them. But more often than not, eventually the cycle would come around and they forsake God. They don't do as he commanded. They pursue life their own way, being swayed by the culture that surrounds them. And they find themselves in a state of rebellion and unfaithfulness. And and one of the stories that we have in the Old Testament that summarizes God's relationship with his people is the story of Hosea and his unfaithful bride, Gomer. Right? Hosea is this prophet who's married to an unfaithful bride, constantly reverting back to prostitution, not keeping her marriage vows, wandering, and she just has this sense of hard heartedness that sin has overrun her heart and is taking control of her life, and she can't do anything to stop it. And here we see Hosea not saying, okay, you have it your way, not cutting her off, not saying, all right, just go and do what you want to do. He's constantly pursuing his bride, that even though she's breaking his covenant, even though she's going her own way, Hosea continues to pursue her, and that gives us a picture of of what God is like towards his people. That God doesn't just give uh, the broken people, like people who are unfaithful, over to what they want. He says, I'm going to keep coming after you. And there's something beautiful about this because what happens when you break a covenant, anytime you break a covenant is gonna leave broken people. That's just what's gonna happen, right? You see this in sort of the wake of disruption uh, in divorce, right? There's broken people in the midst of broken covenants and God moves in towards these broken people. Now God does have biblical grounds to walk away, right? If we talk about uh, sexual immorality, like that, that's the parallel here of this, is that God would have biblical grounds to walk away and say, well, you guys have, have left behind the covenant. You keep going, reverting to your own ways, but God doesn't do that. He stays in the picture. He pursues, he reconciles, he, he takes the brokenness and breathes life back into it, brings healing. He recommits himself to his bride over and over and over again, but, but what happens is, The cycle repeats. People will eventually walk away again. Sin has a grip on the heart that that keeps pulling us back into this wayward way of living where we reject God, but we're unfaithful to his ways, and in doing so, we forfeit the promises of flourishing and blessing that God desires to give us. Now, God looks at this and says, enough, this is it, it's over. And, and, and just when you would expect that God would turn his back and walk out the door, you'd never see him again, God's saying, it's enough. I love you too much to have you miss out on what I have for you. And so he says, I'm gonna make a new covenant. I'm gonna make, make a new radical commitment to you as my people that can't be broken, where God himself is going to uphold, uphold both ends of this commitment. He says, I'm gonna bless you through my own obedience. And he sends Jesus to live the perfect, faithful life, completely observing all that he has commanded, always adhering to the path, to the way of flourishing, the way of blessing, living within God's guidelines for life. And what Jesus does as he walks the earth is he plays the part of the faithful people. He's pure in heart. He's steadfast. He does not wander or veer away from God and his commandments. And you would think that if Jesus were to live this way, it would, it would lead him into the fullness of blessing that, that was, would come with that. And, and, and living a faithful life, all of the blessing that God had intended for his people would go to Jesus. But Jesus doesn't get the benefit of blessings of his faithfulness. Instead, Jesus is cursed. His faithfulness leads him to being cursed on the cross where Jesus gets the death that an adulterer deserves. See, that's one of the the commandments that we see back in in the Torah is that those who commit sexual immorality under the Old Testament law would be cursed and even death would be appropriate. And here we see 
that death being applied to Jesus where he's nailed to the cross. He's put there on account of the unfaithfulness of the people that he loves and has come to save. And there on the cross, he pays for the sins of God's people, not just Israel, but for our sins as well. Every act of infidelity, every time we break the mold of God's design for the flourishing life, Jesus paid the price for those sins, whether that be divorce, sexual immorality, lust, anger, selfishness, and the list goes on and on and on. Whatever those sins might be, which are unfaithfulness to God, Jesus pays the price. He drinks the cup of wrath down to the dregs, and guess what that leaves him? Separated from God. He, as, the, as the weight of sin bears down on him, Jesus is separated from the Father. Right? This is the ultimate sign of divorce where God has turned his back on Jesus. Even though he was faithful, God turned his back on him because Jesus had taken on the sins that he who knew no sin became sin. He took on the sins and was rejected on our account. See, this is the epitome. This is what the broken covenant looks like. This is this, this should have been our trajectory. But Jesus loved his bride, his church, so much that he came to save her. And instead of, of getting the rejection and the curse that we deserve, we receive the blessing and benefits of Jesus' faithfulness that instead of being cursed, we are now blessed by faith in him. And if our faith is in Jesus, we will never, ever ever taste the wrath of God. We will never ever experience what it's like for God to actually turn his back to to say, okay, this is it. We're divorced. It's over. It's separated. If we're in Christ, Christ's righteousness is applied to us. Therefore, we get to enter into the blessed life. It's applied to us as if it was ours and we now get to set course on the good life, this blessed life. And now Paul in Romans 8 says, Who who or what can separate us? There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Jesus has secured us. So our unfaithfulness to God, no matter what that would look like, as long as our faith is in Christ, is secured, that we cannot be separated. This is the radical commitment that Jesus has toward wayward sinners. And if you see this radical commitment that Jesus has towards us, you cannot help but want to reciprocate. Right? You see that, that commitment that somebody has for you and you just want to pour yourself back out and return toward them. And it's, a, it's like, of course I want to follow you, Jesus. If you would go that far for me, I want to follow you. I want to do everything for you. I want to live my life as an expression of following and trusting and reciprocating that commitment to you. So you've brought me into the blessing of the kingdom of heaven. I owe you everything. I want to live for you, this radical commitment. Now, of course, sin still lives in us, right? The, the, the life of discipleship is to put sin to death and to come alive in Christ more and more. But as Christians, our, our desire, our ultimate desire is to be faithful to Jesus. And sin, of course, is gonna uh, lead us astray here and there. Every week we come back to a Sunday gathering. One of the main purposes why we gather is to recommit ourselves to the Lord together. It's covenant renewal, Right, acknowledging the fact that God has been faithful this whole time and, and between Sunday at, at noon till Sunday morning at, at 10 a.m., I have veered, I've walked away, my sin has pulled me away from God and I've, I've chosen a path that leads to my destruction, not to my flourishing. We're coming together to recommit ourselves to God's ways. And as the gospel becomes more and more real to us, as we see the commitment of Jesus and, and, and experience that and taste that love that he has for us, our desires to live faithfully to Jesus get stronger and stronger, but that spills over into other relationships that we have, especially marriage. See, this is what makes marriage such a profound commitment. What we're seeing is, is the picture of marriage where Jesus brings to himself a bride on that last day, Revelation chapter 21, 22. Right, the marriage of the lamb where he brings the bride to himself, this radical commitment where he's so devoted, so committed that, that he's sanctifying her, cleansing her, making her more beautiful. And when we see that happening to us, right, that's our story in relation to Jesus. We wanna see that same thing happen within our own marriages. As the gospel dwells richly in both parties, We become transformed, we become less selfish, we become wanting to be servants to our spouses and not want to be served by them. 
And in this way, right, when the dynamics of the kingdom are at play, when the gospel of power is embedded into marriage, divorce becomes irrelevant because it's, it's this, again, moving into the vision, the more glorious, more beautiful vision of, of what God has for us in marriage and away from the devastation and destruction that divorce brings. And as the gospel is alive in our hearts, there is this repentance, there is forgiveness, there is this pursuit of faithfulness and reconciliation that takes place. Now I've seen really amazing things happen when when the gospel is bearing weight in the context of marriage. I've seen marriage cover, um, uh, I've seen the gospel offer a solution to, to even the most grievous of marital sins. Where people who have been separated for years and for decades just have nothing but animosity towards one another and divorce, be, bring people together and be reconciled. I've seen, seen people who have, have veered out into sexual uh, immorality. God bring recon, excuse me, reconciliation to that marriage, to healing. I've seen all kinds of ways where the gospel has done the, the supernatural to bring people back together who had experienced great hurt and great pain. It's incredible. But the gospel also has a power to keep divorce, the discussion of divorce, from even getting to the table. Because as we live in the gospel, when we become gospel people, it keeps our hearts soft, tender to God's word and his ways. It makes us humble. It makes us quick to repent, right? Because when, when the gospel offers us is the ability to acknowledge my wrongdoing, and instead of hiding it and making excuses and covering it up and blaming the other person, I can take responsibility for it and confess my sins and cling to the forgiveness that I have in Christ. And so the, the pattern here within marriage, a gospel-centered marriage, is, is that of repentance and faith and forgiveness and reconciliation, just constantly spinning that beautiful wheel. And, and the more that happens, the more trust you gain. The more that happens, the more satisfied you become in your relationship of marriage. And if both parties in marriage treat their own sin and their own selfishness as the main problem, right, which is what the gospel does, it says, says I'm the problem, It doesn't shift the blame somewhere else. It makes me take ownership. And when we take that responsibility, it allows us to put our sin to death and to love the other person into life. And in doing so, we become more radically committed to each other and fulfilled in the grace of Jesus at work in our marriages. Now, marriage isn't the only place where this happens. Like marriage isn't the only place where this radical commitment, this covenant is made to other people. And and what really happens when we have this this covenant, this commitment to another person, um, what what it affords you is this stability. It affords you this, this safety and place to grow and flourish and to be sanctified for you to become the best version of yourself that, that Christ has intended you to be. And this is really how the church becomes beautiful. Right, the, the grace of Jesus washes her over, offers a place, a context to grow, to confess, to, to, to find uh, the forgiveness for our sins, to grow in this, to be beautified and restored and to become radiant. See, marriage isn't the only place. This can also happen within the context of a church commitment, right? A, a covenant, and this is why we talk about church membership as covenant, uh, at Sacred City Church is because what we're saying here is the commitment that we have to one another goes beyond, hey, I- I'm here for the music or I'm here because th- this is what you're doing in our city. It goes beyond those things and says, I'm going to stick it out. I'm gonna be committed in a radical way. I'm not gonna bounce when things become hard for me or inconvenient or I don't like what's going on. I'm going to stay committed because the gospel makes me a committed person. It embeds, see, that's the dyma- dynamics of the kingdom working its way out, this radical commitment to one another. Now sure there's gonna be, just like marriage, there's biblical grounds to leave a church, but, but most of the time, the gospel is what keeps us together and gives us this radical commitment. And what this shows us, as the gospel shows us that it puts the commitment of Jesus on display for the watching world. Right, there's so many times in marriage, in church covenants, where maybe we could bounce and say, hey, I don't like this, but we stick it out, and it shows, it's an apologetic for the strength and the commitment that Jesus, that God has towards us, and this radical reorientation that we now have, where we become people who are radically committed to following Jesus in all of life 
to being radically committed in our marriage, radically committed in church membership. And this is what, the gospel is what enables me to keep this commitment, right? To keep me, that, and it even pulls me back in when I've been unfaithful. It keeps me fighting my sin. It keeps me pursuing faithfulness, helping me become a steadfast and faithful person. See, that's, that's the vision. That's the kind of people who are in the kingdom of heaven. It's people who have made a, a, a radical commitment. People who have, have set their face in steadfastness and faithfulness to Jesus, those are the kingdom people. And the only way that you can become that kind of people is when you see the radical commitment that Jesus has toward us. That Jesus would literally go to hell and back for us. That he would bring us out of our sin, bring us out of our destruction, bring us out of the misery, save us from the brokenness of being separated from God for eternity, and bring us into the, the beautiful embrace that we have in him. See, this is what the gospel affords us. This is the kind of people that Jesus makes us. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you for your one way, this unilateral commitment that you have towards us. Even though we can't keep up our end of the deal, even though we fail and are unfaithful time and time again, you have not changed your mind toward us. You have not said, hey, this is it. This is the last straw. Jesus, you are faithful to the end until you bring us to the point where we are presented to God as beautiful and radiant and glorious in splendor on that last day. Would you more and more make us more like you? Give us the power, the gospel power that's embedded in us to be people of our word, of having this radical commitment. A radical commitment that's shaped by you, Jesus. We ask that you would make us into this type of people for our good and for your glory. And it's your name we pray, amen. I love you guys. Let us pursue Jesus together in faithfulness and steadfastness and be kind, become the, this kind of kingdom people. I love you guys. Take care. Have a great rest of your weekend. I'm looking forward to seeing you next Sunday here in person.